And we're back. Yes, we're oh, back. We're on. <laughs> After the briefest of hiatuses, maybe 15 minutes. So we are we are back in action, ready for more. Yeah, how are you doing, Curtis? Doing good, doing good. How how was the last 15 minutes for you? Everything going okay? It was a blur, you know. I, I think I have to I, I, at at some point during one of our commercials, I'm gonna have to to like run over and get my teapot, which I left sure. over there. Sure. I was so sure. thirsty after after this morning's uh, session. I, I I had to go and brew, try and get some tea in oh, in between shows. Absolutely. But uh, for anyone who missed it, right? We had this epic uh, exploration on the, the the kung fu of tea. Just uh, you know, less than an hour ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're now moving on to the Kung Fu of Flute, or as our guest has called it, Kung Flute. Nice. Um, nice. Curtis, I'm excited to introduce to you to another one of my friends, uh, Mr. Cornelius Boots. He's All right. a master of the Shakuhachi Flute, but I'll let him explain to you what that means. Excellent. So, uh, Hello. Welcome to the show. Oh, all right. I just popped in there. Yeah, I just put the new link in um, Facebook so people knew where to go. Made sure I had my own uh, show puer ready for the show. That was a great um, segment with John. It was really cool to see him in his place. Yeah, really fun. Really fun. Oh, yeah. And if I recall correctly, Boots, you too have uh, had tea under Master Wong as well. Is that, am I right? Yeah, I mean, that was how, like, I knew you through you know, music channels and, and all that. But then I met David way through a combination of T people. And I went to Wen Wu in El Cerrito for, for Qigong, where David Wei had gone a long time ago. So, so like, and, and then I was at one of your gallery showings and that's where David and I met for the first time. And yeah, so the whole, the whole like sort of Bay area all down to Santa Cruz, like, Pu'er snob tea community is uh, is like I like I really um, miss it. Of course, I because I moved out here to Pennsylvania in, in just a couple months ago. But also, you know, after after twenty twenty, uh, we weren't. I was already missing it. So yeah, I hope we can um, rekindle that with people in different places. Um, Steve um, Odell was also part of that who lived in Santa Cruz and he's doing very well in Portland. And so he's, he's doing great with his kind of uh, tea house in Portland, Oregon. And um, um, so, yeah, I need to see what he's got and I need to get, I need to try 11 Z's and second breakfast. Now I'm very curious. So I need to <laughs> email John as soon as I get off here. Part, but, I mean, partly just to get the art, but also, of course, I want to taste it. Oh yeah, that's like that was the one missing component, and um, and yeah, it's so it's so great that the two of you are like you know part of this are playing tandem, right? Because it's that it's that thing that we've been trying to do with the comics foo show is to is to like sit at those crossroads, right, and and, and make those connections. Definitely. Yeah, I mean the stuff you guys are doing. I mean, you guys are going to ask me questions, I guess. But I mean, how is it how is it feeling? This like boiling. Speaking of the tea analogies, it's like the pot is boiling for, you know, all this stuff is coming together in terms of actualization of, you know, comics and, and, and the community aspect, the actual work, the actual project, bringing it to, to, to fruition, just how much has to go into final details of printing anything. I mean, even just making a CD and that doesn't have, you know, a hundred pages or whatever. So like, you've got all those pages and the layouts and the templates and the, you know, it's like, I know a little bit what it's like. And it's like, there's this principle of like, the, the whole project is this big and then you do so much work and you've got 10% left and then that this zooms in and that just gets this big. And then <laughs> you do not, it's uh, Zeno's paradox, if you guys are familiar with that, right? I was just thinking of it as like Zeno's arrow, right? It's the arrow that never hits the target. It's only just covering the distance by half. You're always halfway. Yeah, you're always halfway there. And from what I understand, they just ignored it, right? They just like, nobody's ever really dealt with it. Like if you even just across the room, how do you get across the room? At some point, you're always halfway across and then you're halfway across that and so on. By what? So I think it calls into question space time 
this is where the east west thing needs to get together and i'm sure i'm sure yeah well you, okay so here let me throw I, I was introduced to this comic this concept i've been swapping words around <laughs> yeah i noticed that <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i was introduced to that concept in a comic of mm. all places and you know i like to read widely but it was in an issue of the books of magic published by dc comics Nice. And the, the young protagonist who was, you know, you know, really a pre a proto Harry Potter, we can say. Right. Right. You know, he was he was trying to, like, escape from the castle of his of his of his of the person that, that had captured him while he was traveling around in the land of fairies. And the, the, the castle's wall was Zeno's paradox so that no matter how how high he climbed he only ever got halfway you know i hate when that happens <laughs> it's always yeah it's always something when you're a prisoner in a castle definitely uh, you know, on the arrow concept i always think about like machiavelli talking about the goal like if you're shooting with an arrow if you aim at the target you're always going to come up short if the target's far away so the idea is always to aim above and beyond the target so when it naturally the arrow naturally falls you hit the target you know and it, the hard thing is when you're in the middle of any creative endeavor, right? You don't know what, how high you should do it. It's just this constant, you know, process of, of missing the mark, going over. You know. Well, the first time through, that's why I think it's really good. Patrick, you're doing volume two launched yeah. yesterday because you, you're still, it's still fresh, you know, in terms of this whole process, the, 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 the crowdfunding, the, the perks, the communication, the community, and then actually finishing and sending stuff out. Um, and so, uh, speaking of communication, you know, what better timing than than one of one of the the the, the granddaddies of of communicating comics, right? Yeah. So, quick shout out to Pops, hey, who's Pops. like a hardcore advocate for independent comic creating. He's oh, just nice. so willing to to build bridges and just get people together. So he's got another uh, one of those, you know wise man on the mountaintop vibes but with such an open open door it's amazing definitely and then uh cool we've got another another pop. guest showing up there's bane i don't know what time yeah. it is for him but it's the middle of the night uh -huh. <laughs> yeah so kristen briggs has been popping in on a couple of these broadcasts so that's been yeah kind of fun to to keep the conversation going but uh he plays he plays flutes just as big as I play. What? Is that so? Yeah, oh. he's a he's a, a a student of mine and is doing very well with the big bamboo, which is a lot um, a lot trickier than it might seem. It's one of those deceptively simple things. And we've talked about this before, but that's oh 10 p.m. Okay, that's not that's not too late. It's not past his bedtime, I guess yet. But um, he's in Nottingham. So we've also got a little Robin Hood connection here, more more mythology. Um, but um, yeah, you know the distillation of certain arts in the dough in in a lot of Japanese dough. You know the way of you know ikebana or the archery or um, the Japanese version of the tea ceremony or shakuhachi dough. Um, they're distilled and they're uh, you know, minimized for, for heightened effect of the power of the, the, the elements that remain, let's say, which is kind of, um, will, will lead you into ideas of alchemy. And I feel like alchemy and dragons are two things that are, that have their, a long, deep history, both East and West. And I find that really interesting. And, but alchemy in the East was more, um, in the Taoist, um, side of things. And, because shagahachi is a physical skill, um, and because I started doing qigong in 2001, at the same time I started shagahachi, I've always been like, yeah, it's 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 from Japanese Zen, and the history is obviously very murky, but there's um, there's enough lore, and the pieces we play are basically from um, Buddhist monasteries, but the whole thing is like Taoist to me. And it's like playing that the flute is is qigong practice um to me um i think someday there will be a um, um an embracing of that maybe 
in the in the Zen community, but for instance in the Bay Area, nothing against Soto Zen. Soto Zen knows how to do stillness. I'll give them that. But for instance, you get up if you do a whole day of sitting, you get up, and the first thing some of us are going to want to do is like, you know, <laughs> and that doesn't that's not really part of um, part of the vibe there. So there's that there's that slight um, friction, I guess, between. Uh, Buddhist side of things and, and Taoist side of things, which is why a lot of people and a lot of new translations and new authors have this, you know, Chan as the connecting piece, um, which is really what it would have been called in the golden age in China. I mean, Zen's golden age was in China. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, talking about dropping so much info in just what, two sentences. <laughs> You know, that's that's exactly what I'm I'm here for. But um that's uh quick give a, a shout out to Pops again, right? Uh-huh. Did he yeah. just did it? Curtis, you got the reading voice. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, no, Pop Pops just said, Did he just call me the ancient one, honored and humbled at the same time? Means a lot coming from you, my friend. Well, you know, uh, I'm gonna say ancient, but but Pops is influential, right? You notice that we don't even use his full name, Pops Van Sant, when you you know you've made it and you know everybody knows you in the community when you just say the first name and everybody knows. So that's why everybody says Pops. Everybody in comics knows he's like the Don of uh, independent comic books. So that that's what we mean by that, Pops. Yeah, and I mean, the same with Boots, right? I mean, it's just... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm... I'm not the ancient one uh, yet, but I'm aspiring to that. I definitely like that's the... That's the, that's the you know, the sage, the wizen, the sage is the goal. I think we've got a comic already right here, Ancient One and Zeno's Paradox. That's your next project. <laughs> there you go. You heard it here first, people. <laughs> yeah. We, well, we, we just... I want to hear a little bit of flute, huh? Yeah, that would be amazing, right? Yeah, I was just going to ask if Curtis had any questions since uh, since the last... Okay, well, really quick, right? Boots yeah. and I uh, had a few conversations over the course of my Volume 1 campaign, which was so awesome it was great to reconnect and also quick shout out we're talking to one of my uh revered wuxia warriors in the flesh so yeah you know, it's two times two times now two time one. wuxia warrior that's, yeah i'm that, not gonna pass that up duty. <laughs> yeah but um i just had to get that out there before curtis you know yeah. you can uh, deliver your question yeah yeah i mean i mean i know um i heard you mention about qi gong and you know of course you know you musician that idea of the, the breath, right? The breath, whether it's the breath in its literal sense or the figurative sense or the metaphysical sense, I would imagine there's a lot of interplay with that. Like, how did you, where, which, where did you first start? How did, how would you describe that connection between those two practices and, and what you do with uh, the shakuhachi? Yeah, I mean that that is that that question is completely on point because, as a like what I would call I don't know high power. Uh, classical jazz and avant-garde um, read virtuoso, which is what I was before I um, started Shakuhachi. And I only I only use that word in the, in the non-humble sense because you're going to hear how humbling Shakuhachi was right after that. But um, it, it became more and more clear how the breath and spe- specifically rooting um, the actual inhale and then the exhale from the Dantian was was how anything really worked on the on all wind instruments, but especially woodwinds, especially reeds. Um, partly because the reeds are held this way. So I also played silver flute, but the flute held this way. You've got this other kind of dimension going on. Um, whereas clarinet, bass clarinet, saxophone are held um, in front of you as well as oboe and bassoon, the double reeds. So it takes it takes a while to figure out that this thing in your face you're not really there's no power generated from the face there's certain power in the reed itself that's embedded just like in the string on a guitar like this the tension in the string that's being held there is the power that you're sort of overcoming the resistance you're overcoming to get a tone um and so you you get in this very um what i imagine the same in in martial arts where where the power comes from and where the movement is seen, or in this case, where the, the resonance or sound is felt, are spatially distant because the power is just here, 
really. And everything happening up here is just like the, uh, connecting to that. And you get this kind of circulation going when it's really, um, when it's really feeling really good. And so there is, there is just like, you, you basically, as a woodwind player or any wind instrumentalist, you cannot go wrong to obsess about looking into different modalities of, of breath, whether it's going to be pranayama or what we do in different kinds of Qigong. I mean, the irony is the kind we do at Wen Wu, um, we're not coordinating the moves with inhale and exhale. It's one of the few Qigongs where we're not doing that. The one I did for 10 years before that, it was that way. Um, so that, that links a conscious movement uh, to the inhale and the exhale in this kind of flow-based, um, timed way. But again, just so distilled. You know, when you're playing difficult music, orchestral or jazz music, there's just so much going on. And so the reason like Qigong seemed like the right place for me because it went with what I was reading in Zen, reading in Chuang Tzu or Lao Tzu, and then eventually right at that same point, what Shakuhachi presented was um, just so much space, you know, getting, getting rid of um, the complexity and I don't want to call it clutter because it has its place, you, you know, complexity builds up and there's an artful way to do that. But you um you want to get back to first principles to steal a phrase from charles eisenstein who i've been listening to a lot and that's um that's what i wanted to do you know and then the sh the sound of the shakuhachi um and the fact that it's played solo unaccompanied and pieces that are very um hard to understand what's happening until you get into it um but they're, they're very evocative, very elemental. Um, it sounds like, oh, this is just breath converted to tone and maybe like a couple other things going on, but that's almost, that's almost it. Um, actually distilled. That's, that, 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 that's amazing. And I like how you, you hearken to, um, concepts, right? You know, like when you learn any art form, you start with the technique. Right, but the right. technique is really just a gateway to the concept. And once you have the concept, then many techniques can come from it, you know. But you have to go through that to get to that abstract idea. You know, it's like um, in the Kung Fu I do in the Hong Ga system, our highest level form is all about breath and intonations and hitting different vibrations. Oh, know? wow. And, um, and the funny thing is, is so there's first you see it as there's the physical movement and then the qigong. And for those watching that don't know what qigong is, it's it's the breath work. It's the energy work, right, that we're trying to cultivate. In, in Japanese, they refer to it as ki, Chinese qi, right, the, the life force, the vital energy. And the funny thing is, is that the idea that these are two disparate things when you first do the physical and then you separately focus on the breath and the energy. But in reality, when you get to a certain level, it's all energy, right, where we're trapped in this vessel. You have to breathe no matter what you do. It's just yeah. a question of if you're doing it right or wrong, you know, or, or well, efficient. I sometimes call, sometimes I call the breath, the primordial addiction. <laughs> you're great. stuck. You're stuck in that in out in out. Mm -hmm. Like you can't get out of that. If they're yeah. not doing anything else, if you're not doing that, you've got a lot of problems as a domino effect from that. I also like to explain it with breathing because our conscious self kind of goes wandering in the night um in dreamless sleep and then in uh, different astral realms and in, in, in REM sleep you can make a case but you're still breathing there you can make a strong case that you're you you are you're breathing more than you are you because mm. when you're asleep you know if you if you knew you were you and you were sleeping you'd always be able to lucid dream in other words you'd be like boom i'm dreaming let me do go let me go do some cool stuff that i wrote about in my comic book but <laughs> But you, so you're, you you have your identity in a way, but meanwhile the breath is the breath is still is still going, um, and it has this quintessence connector. But what you describe is very important because that that forms a feedback loop, and as you've discovered with students, I imagine the same as my, me with my students, and then seeing them deal with it helps me get better at it. Is it doesn't really matter which where you enter from. You know, as long as you're not dominating, it's not to say the technique is really what's important. This breath stuff, I just got to do it because my teacher says so. No, either one could be somebody's entry point and they, they form us like a, a positive feedback loop over time. And that separation is the third step of alchemy. 
it, well, there's a lot of models of alchemy, but the Rosicrucian uh, model, the third level is separatio, and then the fourth level is a conjunctio. And so that we know that with anything that's technique and skill based is you've got to focus on, you know, oh, just that you know, just this, <laughs> this muscle or this finger or whatever. But then of course you got to reintegrate it with the whole thing and, and so on. I mean, that's why it's fun. That's why it's like, I mean, how did you get into, how did you balance Curtis um, doing as much Kung Fu and teaching as you've done with your comics that you've done? Oh. I mean, it's... Well, it's, you know, you know, balance, you know, I, um, I always tell this funny story and, and I learned a lot about an interesting view of balance from somebody that's not, from a, a spiritual path per se, but I, I used to work, I used to do some concept art in, um, in film. And um, one of the people that I work with close hand was um, the actress, Michelle Rodriguez. And we worked on like some, a project that went on for a while. And she said, if, if you know, she's a person of extremes. And the funniest thing she said about balance is she goes, people think balance is just a straight line. She goes, but really balance is, is, like, is, is, is like what you're trying to achieve. And there's highs and lows. And you hit the balance in between the highs and lows. And so she referred to it as the, uh, the pulse that you have when you're at the hospital. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, and the balance is in the middle. And when you achieve complete balance, flat line, right? So, so, so for me, um, I, I, I don't know if it was, I actually took so, quite a bit of time away from, from, from the art um, because I was focusing on the Kung Fu and, 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 I, and my, I was trying to explain to my parents why I went to art college and took so much time doing that. And then I just essentially abandoned it to do Kung Fu. Mm. And, and what I explained to them is I said, you know, all the drawings I used to do of people jumping and kicking and doing these amazing things to pretend so I can do that in real life. I don't need to pretend anymore and draw it. But then the, you know, kind of wrap it up. What, what, what happened is teaching, I wanted to get more people to know about Kung Fu, about martial arts, what I care so much about. And the entry point of, of doing the actual art requires a lot of commitment. I mean, and a lot of physical exertion, you know. So the idea that that I think for all of us, we all have these things that we learn from previous generations, especially in the Asian traditions, we have this background. And the realization is it doesn't belong to me. Um, I've just been entrusted to be the safeguard to it. And my job, you know, innovation is great, but my job is to try and bring it intact to the next generation. So that's where actually when I went back and I said, OK, well, I have this art background can I dive into this and promote the art and share the art that way? So that's, that's kind of the balance. The, ba the balance has been up and down and all around. Um, but the, the passion and the, the, um, the goal is, you know, always the same, you know, so that's. And, and now you would say they're integrated pretty well. Yeah, definitely. And you know, what's fascinating with breath is, you know, we're talking about Asian stuff. You look at Asian calligraphy, right. And you see the breaststroke by doing martial arts. Even when I was in art college, I started realizing I was using my breath to draw you know, to get the, the line work, to get the, the forcefulness of it. And then and then it was so fascinating when I would go to museums and look at a Japanese Zen calligraphy. It's like I could almost hear the breath looking at the brushstroke. I could see where they tapered off the breath with a quick brushstroke or where they exhaled really hard, pushing the, the brush, you know, inside the canvas, you know. And it's that idea that like art encompasses all senses, you know. When we hear you play your music, I see colors, you know. Not literally, but in a yeah. way yes you know and and so i think that that's so important it, it's they're all paths to the same goal right so there's a lot of overlap yeah for sure yeah, yeah definitely definitely well now that we've gone that far into do you think we might be able to hear a little bit of uh yeah i've got a lot of different kinds of flutes and so i wanted to do a little a little old-timey uh pilgrims hymn on one of these rustic flutes uh that where i wanted to make sure the maker did not um, trim the roots too much um, because it's it's kind of groovy that way so this is this was the root ball some of you watching already know this but so this was in the ground and when they have to harvest uh, this would have been about ground level here and it's, it's hard work harvesting um, you've got to know what you're doing in terms of looking for what diameter what kind of node placement so on the one hand this is a totally just rustic, like we're just playing on it like a, a tube, like a stick, essentially, like take it out of the ground, get rid of the membranes, put some holes in it and chop this top off here. And that's it compared to, you know, making a saxophone, for instance, in the factory. This is very distilled, very rustic, very nature emergent. 
Um, on the other hand, to be able to play some of the repertoire and the challenging repertoire that we're expected to um, train in from, from uh, both the solo Zen tradition or from some of the more like um, chamber music tradition stuff, or even just the folk songs, um, it's got to have certain characteristics to be able to, to, to operate. And those characteristics are get incredibly subtle. Um, but uh, this is a bit wider. A lot of the flutes that I play and my students play are, are a wider bore. Um, I don't have a small flute out right now, but um, this is, this is pr pretty hefty already for a shakuhachi. But the main point here is four finger holes in the front, one in back, and the end is just uh, open. It's just a tube. So when I first saw this in 2001, I had no idea how does this make a sound. Um, this was a section that was taken out of the, this, uh, the Fushi, uh, and so it, it forms a little crescent shape, but it's not like crafted. It just sort of appears because the walls are really thick, if that makes sense. Um, so this part is taken out and this is kind of sanded down. <clears throat> so all this is kind of smooth, but it's like any flute. And I'm going to talk more with Patrick about this for one of the drawings in volume two, but you have to, the, the flute, here's the quick flute lesson. It's two things, airstream and position. So the, both of those things are very involved, but the airstream is essentially just, so there's a, a very narrow stream of air that you can direct um, and keep consistent. <clears throat> so that involves the lips, which we call the embouchure. That involves all your, all the breathing like we were talking about, but then position includes all of the, the big stuff that a bunch of Kung Fu people would know anything about. Anybody who does the physical uh, performing arts or any kind of arts, um, ballet, you know, even if you were a, 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 um, you know, a rock climber and, um, you know, kayaker, you're going to understand about position and balance is going to mean everything from your little toe to your ankle, to your shoulder blades, to your neck, to where your ears are and your head. And, and so, but specifically, where does this go um, here? in order for that airstream to hit where it needs to hit to make a sound. So a, a transverse flute held this way has a smaller distance to go across, essentially the same as playing one of our finger holes. So you can see, it's just this short, whatever this is going to be on this flute, it's about 14 millimeters, uh, maybe 13 across that. Whereas this proportionally is way, way bigger. So I try to use the analogy of like, if you're used to riding a certain kind of bicycle and then you get on a bicycle that's like 25% bigger, you, you're going to really notice that. So to the, to the average person, they have no idea what we're up to with, um, the wider bore, but anyway, um, and there's no lacquer in here. So that's the other way that this is a more rusticated kind of a, a, a practice. But anyway, this is a go, like a pilgrim's hymn from, you know, sometime, I don't know, 1300s, uh, Japan. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Beautiful. 
Beautiful. Absolutely stunning. Thank you. Yeah, it's an evocative uh, piece. Um, I had memorized it. Um, actually, this is another like little connection to the past there. Patrick, I think I was I was in Alameda house or dog sitting or something. And that's when I that's when I memorized this for the first time in 2007. And I really had to figure out what is the phrasing? How does this work? It's, it's in a scale that's not a lot of the other uh, pieces that we play. Um, the, the origins of these pilgrim hymns is still pretty misty to me. Maybe some of the ologists have uh, uncovered uh, useful information, but I haven't asked them because the ologists also tend to say that all the things we say about the history of our instrument isn't actually true because they can't find it written down. Um, even though this is basically also an oral tradition. So we have minor amounts of that to deal with compared to the martial arts, but it's the same thing, you know, um, uh, but yeah, but this piece um, came from somewhere and it's like, I couldn't, I couldn't write a piece like that. It's, it sounds like from a totally another time and place to me. So it's fun to, to, to try to deal with it. Definitely. It's, I mean, it's just so evocative of like almost every Kung Fu movie in yeah. your, that, that you might dream of, right? Like you may not ever find like where that track is, but it's just so in, in the, in the mind of that, of that realm or, you know. It's just part of that vision, you know, and that's one of the things I remember long ago when, when you were, um, you know, just, I don't know if I can say it like transitioning or like just when you were, when you were really bringing out some of your early compositions of the flute. Yeah. And, you know, you were doing this at, well, there was like one cafe where you were presenting and I just, you know, ended up doodling a whole comic strip on oh, yeah, that's on right. my feet while you were playing because it just was creating these images and we're sitting there, you know, sipping our, our drinks and I was like, oh man. And so I ended up with this little improvised one page comic that I just had to, I know I just had to leave, leave it with you because I was like, here, you know, these are your liner notes, I guess. <laughs> I remember that, that's awesome. That's scanned in somewhere. It's on one of these external hard drives here. I got to dig that out. You know, one thing technically I, I noticed it, and, and you can kind of, I, I'm not sure if I, I saw correct, but I thought it was fascinating. It appeared like you were actually using your chin as almost like an extra hand to create leverage and actually reposition the flute to create a bigger gap while you were playing. Was that something that, that, that I was noticing? Because it seemed very fascinating to see that. Very, very perceptive of you. Yes. Um, so <laughs> often with, um, with new students, I'll point out how, like, especially people who, like myself, coming from woodwinds that have, you know, I mean, no flute. So the other great thing about this that's, like, very nerdy but very interesting is it's a five-hold flute. We have this scale, uh, which is a common scale, minor pentatonic or major pentatonic, if you start here. And... Um, but this hole is actually redundant because if we open it, we get the same note as the as everything down in the next octave, which is how all woodwinds work. Um, you get you get you get you, you change the length from longest to shortest, and then you go back to longest, but at the overtone level, and then you do the high notes. So it it really is designed. It is a spiral, um, but this is redundant. So really, it's a four-hole um, flute. But anyway, that's I, I digress. Um, you don't have anything in the middle here. So the middle fingers have just bamboo holding function, as I say. And so the thumb back here and this middle finger are holding the flute. Um, and then I say, okay, what's the counterbalance for this middle finger here? And the, the obvious guess is this thumb, but this thumb has a whole uh, covering function. So it can't be the counterbalance because it's going to be open some of the time. And it's the chin. It's the counterbalance to this middle finger. Um, and it's part of what makes these bigger flutes uh, feel difficult at first because they're not going into this divot here where the, the main... Um, and everybody's physiology is so different. So you get some classic uh, old, old dudes uh, in Japan that you can still find on YouTube and maybe their chin is totally flat and wide and they don't really have much of a divot or the other way around um but either way you can't get used to just nestling this in here to play because now it's up way too high 
But the other thing you're noticing is how this is a pivot for all our other pitches. How do we get the in-between notes? How do we get... The chromatic scale, 12 notes in the octave, but we've only got essentially four holes. So it's with this technique. Thank you, Bane. It's with this technique here where we redirect the airstream down and adjust what I call the breath reach. And so it's got this whole slidey, this whole slidey thing going on. This is why the more of us that could play and the more of us that are available for recording sessions for martial arts, kung fu related films and video games, the better off everyone will be because these are the only flutes that really do that. All the other natural material wooden flutes do a little bit of that, but they're for instance doing it with the finger holes. They'll go, and try to sound like what, 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 what we sound like. But this is a whole nother in terms of this uh, slide, slide quality. Not just a slide quality, but a slide that includes a different texture, going from loud to quiet, or from shadowy to bright, plus a lot of breath effects, which is our main stereotypical. That's featured uh, in Sledgehammer by Peter Gabriel. So actually, that's uh, I probably told this story last time that I was on, where a lot of outside of Japan, people that, that first got into shakuhachi, I believe, this is just anecdotal, my own personal research, were, were keyboard nerds who played the Yamaha DX7, and it had that sound on it, shakuhachi, and it went, whoo, whoo, whoo. Uh, it was like a, you know, a sample or synthesized version with all that breath at the front. And that's what often what they're doing in the movies. That's often what you want. You know, somebody shows up out of it and you want the or whatever. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of sound effects, though, um, which is more nature. You know, you know, you don't you don't need a you don't need a human drama for those to make sense. Our, our, our in the repertoire is not about like the protagonist and the adversary and we're playing this tune for them. So in that sense, I'm glad we're not brought in uh, to some soundtracks that would be sort of co-opting our, our vertical trees and forests, nature, kind of monastic uh, mindset for like, you know, human drama, which we don't need See, more of this, that really. This is exactly why I, I had to like feature a you, one of your playlists as like a read along as um as a soundtrack for reading a tiger's tale right and just like set up a place so that anyone who backed volume one could also go to the website and get your playlist and just like yeah because we were packing and moving when that came out um i was a little remiss in not putting those together but i've been thinking about it still and also i'm not very good at spotify so ultimately i feel like we'll have maybe three or four to, to choose from on Spotify and the same on, on, on YouTube, you know, partly because there's a bunch of small flute pieces, there's a bunch of big flute pieces, then there's live performances and then there's album performances. Um, oh yeah. Speaking of just, which, why don't you, why don't you, I don't think Curtis is as uh, intimately aware uh, as I am about with your work on the, the wood prophecy, which was just released last year, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, uh, well, so that that was a, a group that came sort of organically. I mean, kind of like like you. Oh, I'm an artist, uh, martial arts now. I'm drawing um, art of, of martial arts. It all kind of integrates. A similar thing happened to me where I was, my main group, why I moved to the Bay Area was a bass clarinet quartet called Edmund Wells. There were a lot of bass clarinets in the Bay Area and a bunch of other people that I already knew. Um, and so that was my main uh, focus. And shakuhachi was still kind of just a hobby because it's 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 um it takes a while. I don't want to say it's difficult. It's easy to say it's a difficult. I mean, I would like to be on a panel somewhere, an international panel, where I would make a strong case that it is the most difficult instrument known to humans. Whatever you know, violin, French horn, oboe. These are 
these are tricky, but they've got nothing on what we're up to with this. On the other hand, um, David Way, I'll use him as an example, as a great example. Uh, people who are Kung Fu people, outdoor sports people, meditation people, maybe sometimes yoga, they can often enter this instrument at a higher level because of the mind-body um, balance uh, constellation that some part of them understands. And I hope it's all right to, to, to revisit this without David's permission here. But when, when I got, helped him get a flute and we just did a short trade, um, I did a short lesson and he, he showed me some stuff. He was doing typical stuff, you know, let me see if I can imitate it. You know, basically all beginners, it's kind of like, and, and that could go on for like four months. Um, and so David did that for a couple minutes and then all of a sudden he dropped into like Kung Fu master mode and he was like, like just like that. So in a way to the modern human that's very in their head and very used to, here's a set of techniques and apply these and this is how the tone, the sound is produced. Or frankly, we're used to push button instruments. No offense to piano players, but it's a push button instrument compared to a flute. Um, it's about a state of mind and understanding, okay, the body has an intelligence. The breath is fueling both the intelligence of the body and the mind and connecting all these together. So. It is difficult, but it, um, it, if you, if you understand about balance, you can kind of enter through, through kind of a, um, a side, a side gate. <laughs> it's a, a small dragon gate. Um, so anyway, I was practicing, taking lessons on shakuhachi, but the bass clarinet was my main thing and the quartet. Um, but eventually I had done pretty much everything I felt like I needed to. All this bamboo was calling for me to do more to let my lips and fingers only deal with them. So I had to let go of those uh, other other instruments, but I've already written and recorded a bunch of stuff for that, especially the four bass clarinet format. There was no plan, but eventually organically, uh, a kind of a four taimu, uh, which is the name of these bigger wide bore, uh, what I sometimes just call bass shakuhachi, um, uh, sort of emerged in 2019. And so I wrote one piece that premiered in 2019 for four of us playing together and then um, realized that was actually the first movement of a whole five movement suite that is called Wood Prophecy. And, um, and, it, and it came out, it came out, it, it was very rewarding. It came out really good, I, um, I think, because I've been writing for a small group or what I call same instrument quartets for, for, since about 1996. And so it just, um, it's just another way to experience the timbre of this instrument. There's a kind of a both and. It seems like a paradox or a contradiction, but really it isn't. I mean, our solo unaccompanied pieces that we have from the Zen monastic uh, repertoire um, in that tradition is um, so important. Like there's nothing else like that on the planet either. There's no solo unaccompanied woodwind rep solid repertoire and tradition. Somebody knows of one, put it in the comments. You get a few Bach flute sonatas, you get the Ney flute playing some solos and Sufi dervish music, but there's no like piece after piece and a long history of it. And part of why I think that is for this is it's there's so much subtlety. coming around th throwing stuff in the mix there where it's like us and the bamboo and the breath and the, and the notes the intervals we've got plenty to deal with so it was never really the plan to come up with a, uh, an ensemble piece but you know I also am a riff uh, riff riff crafter is my new term I've, I've let go of riffology because I, I decided to not be an ologist of any kind even though I'm always studying stuff and so things like that 
is really fun for me to do. You have to do circular breathing. You have to lay down a solid groove. It's got forward motion. This kind of medium tempo baseline riff is something that I really gravitate to as a player. So I incorporate that in my solo and accompany pieces over the years. But eventually it was like, yeah, I just want to do that. And I can get some of my students that are sounding really good to, to, to jump on top of that with melodies or solos and other parts. So that's how it grew just very organically. And that's what, uh, that's what Wood Prophecy is all about. I mean, that's what the musical part is all about. What the concept is about, you'll have to go to the old band camp. It's only on band camp because the pieces are like 12, 15 minutes long, all the movements. So uh, Apple and, 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 and Spotify, you don't get you know, that long form kind of, yeah, it's just not, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a TikToker album. I don't, even know. I don't even know what TikTok is, but I know that it, it involves small time increments. This is like old. I was like, no, this is going to be a substantial. So it has the same scope, you know, I think is why Patrick's excited to, that, that I also completed it. And it came out also around the same time you guys were, I mean, it is, it does have an epic proportion to it. I've written a lot of multi-movement pieces before, but this is five movements and it turned, it's about maybe 50 minutes total. So that's, that's as a composer, you don't always get that. Um, it's more and more I challenging. Mean, once you hear like you have on your YouTube channel, you have like one of your debuts with your quartet, I think during probably before you really formalized Wood Prophecy. And then once you right. hear it, you just you can't get that out of your head, you know, so. That's great. Yeah, I don't know when we're going to be playing, you know, Carnegie Hall, but it's um, it's going to be a long it's going to be a long haul. I think I think it's so that just this the timbre of this and the idea that there's multiple ones of us. I even had a colleague who has, uh, you know, I'm always looking for who can help me book shows. This is a big riddle for performers, especially avant garde instrumentalists. Um, and I was talking to someone who has a pretty successful woodwind chamber group about their booking person. And I thought, oh, you know, one flute, just playing this like solo, if I'm going to play some of my pieces and some meditation stuff, that might be a little hard for an audience. But, you know, a group of us, maybe there would be more to get into because they've done a lot of studies on this, like busking. If you're playing by yourself out on the street, you don't make nearly as much money as two of you playing. And then if you were to split it, people are just attracted to a group. In fact, as a musician, that's the main thing. If you meet somebody on the plane or you're a musician, they'll either say, do you have any shows coming up or do you play in a band? Um, even almost before what instrument do you play? Although they usually ask that too. So people are just very attracted to the interaction of different people, um, doing stuff together. But, but this guy was like, I don't know. I don't know if you want to try to come out with like four, four shakuhachi, maybe just try to book your solo stuff first. So they're only dealing with one. Um, but yeah, I think once you get over that, but I mean, some of you are primed for it. I mean, this is why, like I say, the tea community, the Kung Fu community, I'm very interested in seeing, um, if uh, some of the stuff I've been doing is like a good um, inspiring soundtrack for uh, doing work or practice too. Definitely. So. I, mean, I mean, I can say just from hearing your performance today, Kung Fu people strive to look as cool as you sound. So we, we spend our, <laughs> so, so that, that's my first thought. I'm going to use that quote. Yeah. Yeah, hey, hey, you can quote me on it. You can, and, 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 and the other thing is I was going to think is you, you used the word monastic, right? Yeah. And I think that is so out of the common vernacular because very few people practice anything that comes from a monastic background at this point. So many art forms have been distilled to that whole secular kind of um, aspect of things. As a, as a, as a traditional Gong Fu style, it's the same thing. Uh, you're talking about the length of the piece. I remember when I went to my friend's Taekwondo school, he was a Taekwondo instructor. And I, I, I made a big faux pas, I didn't realize it. He, he had one of his students perform a sequence of movements, a set. And after the sequence was very short, you know, for us uh, as Hong Gastas, our sets are long even for Gong Fu people. And Gong Fu sets are very long because of that monastic route. Right. But when you have something like Taekwondo that, that's fairly modern, came through a militaristic kind of um, right. system. So they did their set. And after they were done, I asked my friend, I said, that's really nice. I said, is that a beginner's form? Is that a white belt form? And he goes, no, that that's one of our black belt forms. And I was like, oh, because... The most basic thing that I've learned within my Kung Fu curriculum is longer, three to four times longer in sequence and to some degree complexity than even the black belt form. Not 
not to knock it, we're just talking about curriculum, right? Um, yeah. Adaptability is something different, right? But it's that idea when, you, when you've trained in something that's a monastic art form, your perspective is different because these are people who did it for um, self-development, for a spiritual component, where it's not about exactly. that cookie cutter factory, get it out, how many people can we get? It's more, instead of me coming down the mountain to teach you, you come up to the mountain to learn from me, right? Exactly right. And now that's another riddle. How do you do the master on the mountain marketing plan? Uh, it's very I, difficult. You're working well, against yourself. Oh, I haven't. I made a career out of it, you know. And, and, and I often say, I often yeah. say to my students, say, you watch the Kung Fu movie and the Kung Fu movie is about the student. The Kung Fu student climbing up the mountain to see the master, right? That's a nice story. You never hear the story of the master, right? He's freezing his ass up right. off, on top of the mountain, looking down, looking at people walk two steps up the stairs and leaving. One step yeah. of the mind leaving it. My God, when is somebody going to come and take my art from me? I'm, I'm getting old. I'm getting tired, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I need some I need some different kind of noodles to eat up here. I hope somebody yeah. brings something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I'll just yeah. mention, speaking of that, like sort of hermit, um, hermit idea, um, I'm, I'm assuming you've maybe both seen Amongst White Clouds. And if you haven't... I, I haven't. I haven't. I would, I would, I would definitely yeah. check it out because if, there's a book... Um, Red Pine did a book that's like, oh, this is a bad one because I can't remember his, his book. Somebody put it in the past. Red Pine did a book where he visited in the 80s the mountain hermits um, that were still in, in the mountains in China. And then a young filmmaker kind of recently, like 15 years ago, went back on that same, tried to redo some of his path there in the Shongong Mountains, I think it is, and, and, and visits a bunch of these different hermits. And it's so awesome because they are real human beings. And they're also very different from each other. This is what this is what's so cool about it. There's like definitely one guy that I'm like I don't know if I'm buying what he's selling, uh, but he's very entertaining. Um, but a bunch of other ones, and there's a nun in there, and um, yeah, they're all doing what you'd expect. They're they're making they're boiling their vegetables and trying to figure out where their water comes from and writing calligraphy and poetry and you know, but none of them are playing. Uh, uh, big flutes. So I feel like this is this is our this is our like when you first get into shakuhachi, that becomes this hermit fantasy, really, because there's so much to to do with just this flute. And you'd be like, yeah, this 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 rounds out this idea of of being a hermit. You know, like there would be no way you would get bored. Plus, it feeds into your scripture reading and your meditation and um, breath. You know, chi, you'd stay in shape. Um, so yeah, that's a big a big part of. Um, the appeal is just, it's just the work isn't going to end. But I see what you're saying about longer. Yeah, like for instance, uh, <laughs> the piece I'm trying to memorize now, um, you know, compared to the piece I played, this will probably be 12 minutes or so at the end of it. But this is the notation we're dealing with as well. Not everybody has this notation we're dealing with, but um, this is a particular, you get different penmanships. Um, so you might see, you might see this also kind of, penmanship so it is calligraphy scores katakana syllables yeah um so yeah those these solo pieces um are um really really long i don't know what time it is but maybe i should play the beginning of this one i'm trying to memorize and just and then we'll think yeah about wrapping it up what do you yeah, guys that feel sounds, about that sounds great sounds like a play
Amazing. Oops, I, I just kicked him out of the stream. I was so excited. I I just sorry. You're Patrick. There. Sorry, it was just it was amazing. That was absolutely stunning. Thank you. I think that was my bad. But yeah. <laughs> we were just so moved, Boots. Oh, absolutely. That's about yeah, that's about five and a half lines in, but I love the opening of this piece, which is part of why I wanted to memorize it. It's got the additional effect, uh this breath pulsing effect that's in some of our pieces, there are some sects that do this on every piece. So a piece that we might learn as. Um, this, uh, a couple other sects might play it already, that same phrase with the breath pulsing. Instead of just sustaining it. So we've got a bit of that mixed in to the repertoire I learned, and this piece ha is one of them that has it at, at the beginning. It has a lot of low, um, low notes um, at the beginning, which is my, which is my uh, favorite. The low notes. <laughs> well, you're you're getting a lot of love. Yeah. Here's uh, uh, Stephanie Nina Pizzarello, a, a good friend and also a Wuxia warrior, so a, a kung fu sister to you, Boots. That's yeah. exciting. I love nice. all of these connections. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's excellent. I love that undulating tone that you had there with that that one uh, part that you just it really just like for lack of better like, luxurious the sound of it, you know. Um amazing, amazing. It just tells a story. Like the story is just oh. there to be like discovered more than yeah. anything right. else. Right. Right. Yeah, no, it is it does have real narrative qualities for sure. And the other key thing about it is, which is a big contrast to like, like I say, the, the riffs and playing things that I do like with, 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 um, grooves, um, um, and, and baseline riffs is Honkyoku, which is the name of the Zen, this Zen repertoire is really unique, not just for the other reasons that I already preached about, but it's completely pulse free. So for instance, if you were going to do a folk song and have something like, That's got a beat, and that's like most music, especially if you're gonna sing or play with other people. Then we've got um, lullabies that I've sort of freed up. They also have a melody, and Japanese lullabies, I mean, at least the ones we've learned, are pretty fun to demonstrate because they're they're a little dark for people as a lullaby, but like. <laughs> That's obviously got a melody, but I'm I'm st stretching and, and compressing parts of it because you figure that's somebody probably singing by themselves. And the Pilgrim Hymn I played earlier is further on the spectrum of really dissolving this idea of pulse. And then these uh, these monastic pieces um, are completely pulse free. There's no beat, and, and it's not even anywhere nearby. I, I would I would. Say. Even though we're like the breath pulsing sounds like okay, that's a pulsing that comes from the breath, but it's not like there's a metric that we're lining up with. And this is another thing you're only really allowed to do that um, solo unaccompanied. As soon as you're as soon as you're playing with other people, you got to have a way of 
of trying to figure out about playing together. And as a woodwinder, you know, Western music woodwinder, you're, you're never playing by yourself. Um, you're an ensemble player, almost like I say 99% of the time. So, um, how are you going to be a hermit if you have to do that? Yeah. <laughs> how are you going to be a hermit in this modern day? Right. That's yeah. yeah. That's the question. Definitely. Support our Kickstarter, folks. Support <laughs> That's right. Then you've got good reading material. It'll be shipped right to you. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it immensely. That was amazing. Really. Excellent. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. This was this was really fun. Good, yeah. to, good to have a chat. We can go for... It would be... I mean, I don't know what the schedule is going to be coming up, putting schedules together, but it would be fun to get on with um david um or with um i thought of somebody else that we could have on at the same time if you've got more of these that you're scheduling um just throw these ideas around um, sure I'm we sure. are we are scheduling a few and we've only just announced um this week's lineup and we we still have a ways to go so you know boots the door is always open. you know bay area right the door is always open <laughs> um so yeah and david way will be will be showing up towards the very end i think he's gonna be our like uh our grand finale i think if if the stars are aligning the way they seem to be you know good good but yeah, uh, you can get everybody we can get everybody to do all the um circulation slapping the last time that i went out to him i was having him because these flutes are really big so i've always got different stuff happening so he's my um circulation and self-help deep tissue uh, consultant. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Curtis, I don't know if you've ever actually met David like face to face, but you know, aside from the fact that, you know, he's nearly seven feet tall, right? The moment that he meets you, he's just like, okay, you've got tension here and here. And he'll just start like immediately like working out whatever it is that's going on. So it's just like, Within the first five minutes, you're like, oh, my God, this guy's my best friend, you know? <laughs> cool. Yeah, and, and, and likely pouring some good tea at the same time, so. Yes, indeed. If only we've got to figure out a way to get that through the screen, you know? Yeah. Right. Download yeah. tea here, right? <laughs> yeah. Kung Fu Cha app. Yeah. yeah. There you go. But I, I'm still working on a, on, a tea, on a tea tier, but not quite there yet, you know? <laughs> Yeah, those are tricky. I did those on my crowdfunding campaign several years ago. I had a little bit of tea samples for everybody. And um, I think it was worth it. Yeah. But I did try to include instructions on, you know, a little bit of steeping the loose leaf stuff and measure them out, get a bunch of little bags, you know, just logistics. Exactly. Just, just yeah, so I you mean, just think about that, you know, be like, it, it you're not going to be able to afford whole... to send out entire uh, bricks, you know, but. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah, well, Curtis. Curtis is just about has not even entered the realm of the the, the logistics just yet. But, yeah, uh, yeah, looking forward some, to it. Something to look forward <laughs> to. Yeah, yeah. Um, Curtis, did you have? Oh, look at this. We have another. We have yeah. another uh, guest. Story oh. comic. So this is Barney Smith, right? Who will be joining me tomorrow for Wuxia Wednesday. Uh, Barney Smith is a. Uh, you know, an interviewer with his own show, Story Comics. Great, great to see you. He interviewed me um, last year during my campaign. I think I might have watched that. Wrote, that was a good interview. Yeah. Yeah, and he's 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 got a sharp. He's one of those sharp ones. Yeah. And he's traveled the world, and he has his own tea stories. So we've we've gone down that rabbit hole as well. So he and I will be. Uh, I've got a special surprise for him that I don't want to spoil here, but. Uh, We'll be having some fun tomorrow at around what two p.m. PSD maybe. I got the schedule somewhere, but it'll be you fun. Just had another, part... Speaking of fun, you just had another fun wordplay there. Is it because it's the year of the rabbit? Does it also mean it's the year of the rabbit hole? It or... is. You know, actually, <laughs> what actually, does that mean? <laughs> well, you would have to read the latest article on KungFuMagazine.com to uh, to know because. Tonight's guest, Gene Chang, just released his article on the subject. Oh, cool. So I got that turn of phrase from him. So we'll have to ask him tonight. That'll be one of the hard questions we're going to put against them. Yeah. But 
yes, yeah, Stephanie says Barney is great, you know, so he's, he's a fun person to talk to. It'll be good to, to catch up with him. I'm only sorry that you won't be able to make it, Curtis, but... Oh, yeah, me too. Well, hopefully, maybe we can connect uh, sometime in the future, but... Oh, definitely. I'll, I'll, I'll try and get you on his show, because you two will have a good time. Yeah. You hear that, Barney? Get Curtis <laughs> on. But, um... Curtis, do you have any more questions for Master Boots here while while we've got the man? I I do, but I think I'm gonna I'm gonna hold those for for later because my mind is still spinning from all the, the amazing information and just the performance, absolutely riveting. And you know, it's 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 a unique thing when you're supposed to be the host of the show, but you feel like you're in the audience because you're enjoying it so much. So th thank you very much for that. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the best thing was that I just you know I just got a look at this. Oh, where'd it go? So yeah, the uh, Barney right. and Curtis crossover in the near future. Very, I, I love like one. One of the things I love is circling those things around. So, oh, it's thank great you. to see. And um, boots. Yeah, I know. I I trust that you'll be back. You know, but any any yeah. closing commentary yeah, or? Well, you know, just want to remind everybody how cool is Volume One. And don't you want to make sure that you've already chosen a level for Volume Two? Um, yeah, um, breathe deep, um, mind clear like space. That's it. That's all you need. Those two things. Actually, I need some more tea, but, um, <laughs> that's what I'll get as soon as we're, as soon as we're off. No, this has been really fun. These are the kind of, uh, conversations I'd like to have more of, and I do with my students, but, um, which was another reason I left the, the Western instruments, you know, teaching clarinet and talking about Zen to seventh grade clarinetists was fun. And most of them appreciated it because woodwinders self-select to be there already the cooler people in my not so humble opinion. <laughs> but still, um, to talk about a lot of this stuff as relates to this instrument is, is like a immediate goes with, um, as opposed to a kind of, very similar to what you said about Taekwondo, the same thing where basically I realized, okay, as much as me and the bass clarinet have had a great time together, um, the origin of the design of that instrument comes essentially from marching band. Um, and so where something kind of comes from, it's sort of source point origin inception uh, intention kind of, kind of sticks with it. And it's not that it can't do something completely the opposite. I mean, you could use, you could use a bass clarinet army to demilitarize the world or, you know, like, like I believe that, but as a practice, when you're sort of tuning in deeper and deeper and deeper into the thing, um, there's a, there's, there's a more magic to uncover. I think when it's actually coming from an intention, like, um, a lot of these, these, uh, arts uh, came from, there was this coordination you know, connecting heaven and earth, for instance. Definitely. I never heard anybody suggest that in concert band in ninth or tenth grade, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I did hear it in Qigong class, it made a lot of sense to me. And I think we're doing that with these flutes also. Absolutely. That's awesome. Boots, can I, can I impose one request from you? Sure, yeah. So this is something I've, I've mentioned to Curtis in describing, you know, your artistry is how you've been able to take like contemporary music and, and, con and convert them into, into shakuhachi flute. I know, I know you've done that more than once. So I'm wondering if you could uh, close us out with, with a little something that, you know, anyone will recognize Well, I I could do a novelty number for sure because I've I've been doing some bass lines with some of my students and I was pointing out the difference between, you know, a Black Sabbath bass line or the bass line from Rapper's Delight, Good Times, for instance. So, um, you know, that might be the easiest since I already have that. I mean, the small flute is out, but I'm not going to play all of, of Heaven and Hell, which is another Black Sabbath. But, um, yeah, what is something shorter that I could do? Um... Nothing that I've really practiced too much lately. Um, but I could do a little bit of that, actually. Yeah, let's do a little bit of 
of heaven and hell because it's kind of anthemic. And then you get to see the, the flute that a lot of other people are playing. I, won't, I, I, may, I may or may not do the whole tune because it's kind of an epic tune itself. Excellent. Wow. So, so awesome. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. And then next comes the guitar solo and then the up tempo part. And so, yeah, I'm, uh, because I'm playing my next show, it's, there's, it's, we moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There's great churches here, great architecture. So that's why I'm trying to play a couple shows coming up and I can't help. But if I, if I don't really know the congregation or know that they have a music service that much playing in a church, I'm going to bring all my I've got a tune called Purgatory, I've got a tune called Beautiful Demon, and I've got Heaven and Hell, this is the cover song, so I think those want to be played in the church, so I'm working up that as the, as the closer for this show in a couple of weeks, so. Very cool. Uh, well, definitely keep us posted on that, because you know I'll definitely want to elevate that voice and get people in, the, in that church, you know? Yeah. Very good. Excellent. So I think we have a little bit of business to, to wrap up for the show, Boots, but, you know, I can just say thanks again and, and yeah. look forward to our next time. Yeah, definitely. Great to meet you. Thank you thanks so much. Thanks so much. And uh, <laughs> congratulations on your uh, great work and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll talk okay. again soon. Bye. That was too cool. That was way too cool. That was awesome. Great, 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 great performance. Thank you, Patrick, for having him on. Oh, man. I just feel, like I said, I'm always saying, I just feel so fortunate to be, um, to to have gotten to know such such talented individuals, you know? And, and it's not just like the, the Kung Fu Masters that I've gotten on the cover of a magazine. Sure. But, well, but you know, just that circuitous life I've lived, you know, has let me cross paths with folks like Boots. Oh, definitely. It's that it's that energy attracts energy, right? It's that it's that kind of thing. But um, well, as we as we wind down, um, just to let everybody know, we'll be back at eight p.m. for our big comics food show after dark. But before that, I'm going to be making an appearance at the comic book school. So um, they're live streamed. They have a YouTube channel, and it's comicbookschool.com. And at what time so will that be? 
That will be at 5 p.m. Pacific, okay. 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'll be there with, with my collaborator, Vince, whose last name I'm esca is escaping me. So sorry, Vince, but it's been a long few days. That said, we'll be discussing the animated trailer that he helped me, that he created on my behalf. And uh, Excellent. we'll go into those details. So at the comic book school, before we come back here tonight. Mm -hmm. For our special guest, Jean Ching, uh, publisher of Kung Fu Tai Chi magazine. Um, you'd say a mar uh, martial artist. You know, he's definitely a, a, a Sifu at the Sifu level, a disciple of Shaolin. And uh, mm -hmm. he really want to uh, have your interest speak. He did, line, he did line dance for the Grateful Dead. And he went to the Shaolin Temple with Ruza from the Wu-Tang Clan. So those are just... Yeah, tru truly, he's, he's, a, he's a, you know, a scholar and a warrior. You know, like this whole day has been very much about like exploring, you know, the concept of Kung Fu in a nonviolent fashion, right? Like the, the, the lesser known concepts behind it. And, you know, having Gene on to just round it out in a mm -hmm. kind of an ask me anything sort of context, I think just, you know, will make this an awesome whole, you know, like totally. we, can, cause we can discuss comics with him. We yeah. can discuss movies with him. We can discuss music. You know, the music, it's just, just about anything. So, you know, folks, come up with any questions that haven't been answered yes, yet will get hand answered tonight. Definitely. And uh, I think as we as we finish up here, um, we'll go ahead and remind everybody to check out our Kickstarter campaigns. And if you're interested, please make a pledge, share, all those things. Again, where our goal is to promote Kung Fu culture and Kung Fu as a martial art through our various projects. Um, so... What do you say we start with, uh, since again, it is Tiger's Tuesday, let's start with uh, a Tiger's Tale and then a little bit of Shadow Ghost. How's that sound, Patrick? That sounds great. And then remember, I also have another special clip queued up. Mm -hmm. So we're doing the whole after credits sequence. We've been able to keep that going. So after our credits, mm -hmm. stick around for another special tidbit. Yep, our post credit sequence, our post-trailer exactly. sequence. Exactly. There's a theme happening here. I think we're Definitely. pulling it off. Definitely. So don't miss out. I'm gonna. We're gonna go ahead and start now. Lugo, author, illustrator, comic creator, and the art director for Kung Fu Magazine for more than 20 years. But I'm here to talk to you about a project that's really special to me. It's the middle grade graphic novel, A Tiger's Tale. Imagine the story of tigers and dragons and martial artists and monsters. So when I launched the campaign for A Tiger's Tale Volume 1, I did not know what to expect, but it succeeded thanks to a group of passionate backers. It was also awarded the Make More Comics art grant that year and was later featured as part of an art gallery exhibit. And that's why I'm coming to Kickstarter to cover production fees, printing, copy editing, things like that. Books completed, with the exception of a few pages I've set aside for color over the course of the campaign. This turned out to be a popular feature of Volume One's campaign, so I thought I'd bring it back for Volume Two. I think it's going to be great fun for everyone. Hope you'll support the campaign. I'm very excited about it. Thanks for stopping by. As a kid, I loved kung fu movies, so I went to Chinatown 
trained with a wise teacher, and became a Kung Fu master. Sounds simple, right? Not really. My journey, like the study of Kung Fu, was as arduous as it was rewarding, filled with as many secrets as revelations and as much heartache as triumph. It's a defining moment in my life, and while I began studying Kung Fu to learn how to fight, what I discovered was a way to live. Martial arts never came easy to me. I was far from talented and even farther from being the chosen one. It was only through years of tenacious perseverance that I was able to make steady progress. And so I was surprised when my master told me that I should teach Kung Fu and share the art outside of Chinatown. I did just that and taught Kung Fu to my own students for 20 years. I always wanted to do more to share the art of Kung Fu with others, but was limited by only being able to teach those within my immediate area. What about the rest of the world? Then one day, I had one of the deepest insights about Kung Fu. I realized that the punches, kicks, throws, and myriad of martial maneuvers are merely the delivery system for the true essence of Kung Fu, the philosophy and way of life. Having worked for years as a professional artist and storyteller in film, animation, video games, and comic books, I realized that I could draw upon this unique skill set to share my passion for Kung Fu with the greater world. And so I created Shadow Ghost, a Kung Fu comic by a Kung Fu master. The first issue is created entirely by myself, from story and art to colors and lettering. Every panel is filled with unprecedented accuracy in its depiction of Kung Fu by a comic book creator who knows from first-hand experience what it means to be a Kung Fu master. Battle Ghost is a martial arts coming-of-age story about a young man whose search for the truth about a legendary hero leads him to study Kung Fu and, through a twist of fate, becomes part of the legend himself. For the first time in comic book history, you can immerse yourself further in each issue with Kung Fu skills technology powered by Tiger Crane Kung Fu. Scan the QR code at the back of the comic and follow an exclusive link to an online instructional video where I teach you Kung Fu techniques featured in this series. With Kung Fu skills technology, you can do more than just read about the Shadow Ghost Saga. You can become a part of it. The first issue is completely finished and ready for print. All that's needed is for you to make a pledge of support so that we can fund the printing of the first issue. Together, we can share the wisdom of Kung Fu with the greater world. Shadow Ghost is the story of Kung Fu. It's about the people, the art, the culture, and the philosophy. It's my story and the story of those that I've learned from, taught, fought, and loved. Join me and become part of the vibrant legacy in a place and time where we might not be the chosen one, but where we can make a choice to be part of something bigger and greater than just ourselves. I'm Sifu Curtis Fujita, and this is Shadow Ghost, the Kung Fu comic by a Kung Fu master. within the definition of Kung Fu. Kung Fu doesn't mean fight or self-defense. I'm sure this is a tired conversation amongst your listenership, but Kung Fu just means hard work. And so in that regard, it's just your work ethic. It's just, you know, your grit, your elbow grease, your midnight oil. It's, you know, anything you put your skill to is your Kung Fu. And for some, it could be pff, how well they tweet or, you know, how, how way they play Call of Duty is, is whatever you put your time and energy into, you're going to get good.